Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Kenna Metal webinar. Uh, Steve George and Danny Davis again. Hey, guys. So we hope everybody's doing well. Really glad that uh, yeah you're able to attend this and spend a little bit of time with us today. So um, just to kind of introduce our topic a little bit. So it's just going to be a little different in that this series that we're going to do now is it's not focused on one particular tool. Um, this is a little bit more of an educational series uh, to help people figure out how to get the most out of their tools and out of their machining processes. And this is a topic you know we've wanted to, to tackle for, for a little while. So um, we'll get into it in just a second. Um, just put a little note down here for everybody. Uh, down in that lower right hand corner, for those of you that are on the click meeting uh, interface, you've got a chance to type questions in and um, Yes, definitely. We will try to answer those as we go through. Um, so please feel free to get those started. For those of you that are on Facebook, uh, down there in the comment section, please feel free to leave us questions. If we can't answer them during uh, the webinar, we will do our best to get to them afterwards. If you're watching this later on YouTube, feel free to put something in the comments and, and we will check those as best we can and uh, try to make sure that we answer people's questions. And, um, you know, Facebook and YouTube, please, if you like this video, give us a like, subscribe, yes. uh, try to stay up to date with content we're putting out. Again, this will be a, a part of a series, so this will be a multi-part series. So we're going to go from today's topic where we talk a little bit more about what chip thinning is. We'll get into that in a second. And then what we will build after this webinar on how you can use it in a lot of different scenarios. So hopefully that sounds good to everybody. So, um, yeah, with that, let's, let's get started. So, Danny, why don't you talk a little bit about what chip thinning actually is, and, and we'll get this thing going. Yeah, so, Steve, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. You know, it's, it's, um, it's pretty simple, um, but it's also one of the, I think, one of the most uh, useful things that we can use in, in milling, especially, uh, and, and is misused a lot of times. People don't really understand it or don't uh, consider it when they're doing their programming. But basically all chip thinning is, is any time that the theoretical chip thickness is not what the program feed per tooth would be. So, you know, it, it, that chip is going to actually be thinner uh, for multiple reasons, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But, but when that chip is thinner, that's when we can, what we consider, you know, chip thinning. And, right. and, there, and what we want to talk about today is how to account for the chip thinning so we can maximize the tool's capability. So, you know, maybe if you could... Explain a little bit, Steve, about you know what are the different types of chip thinning that we have. Sure, absolutely, and um, we'll definitely use uh, some slides today. Uh, sorry if we're a little bit heavy on slides today. You know, we, we like to do a lot of things with with kind of demonstrating things with cameras, but uh, we hope that it'll make it a little bit easier to see see things. And and yeah, I mean, one point definitely to take from what Danny just said: chip thinning in of itself is not really the goal. We're not necessarily trying to make those chips thinner. What we want you to understand is what causes the chip thickness to actually change with your parameters and then to try to figure out how to exploit that to keep your tool running in the Absolutely. best possible scenario. So, Danny, you asked the question of the different types of, of chip thinning, and um, we've got a, a little bit of a chip here. Let's just real quick before we show this slide, um, I'm going to go back to the camera here for just a second. I want to get a little definition in just for everybody. So just with a little, little 3D printed model of what we mean when we talk radial and what we mean when we talk axial, just right. to make sure the definition is good. Make that clear. So when we talk about radial, we mean <clears throat> in this direction. So basically perpendicular to the main axis of the tool, the spindle axis. So radial direction is anything perpendicular mm -hmm. to the spindle axis. Axial is anything parallel to the spindle axis. So, so just keep that in mind, and, and hopefully that helps as we go through. So, yeah, let's go back to, to what we were getting into there with the presentation. And um, So this is a, a really good slide that basically this, this image right here for – for lack of a better way to put it, you you want to burn in your mind, yeah. you know, um, and have have that thought that what we have here 
if you look, there's two there's two circles there. Okay, and this is really just as simple as you know your tool is in the first position at a moment in time. Okay, it's rotating and feeding. All right, so let's say I'm rotating and feeding in, and if we take you know, the time, let's say, of one cutting edge to go through and make a chip, especially when we're talking about round tools. Um, and a lot of this stuff, I already saw a, um, a little question about turning. So we're going to talk a lot about round tools, but when we get some of the indexable stuff, a lot of these formulas and concepts are going to work for you if you're getting into um, your, your inserts as well. So, right. um, But basically, <laughs> we're looking at forming a chip. We're in one position. Of course, we're cutting and moving through. So what you see here, let me turn my pointer on. All right. So what you see in this area, you've got the, the white circle is the initial portion, uh, position of the tool. Then this red circle here is where it's moved as it's made that cut. And you can see this cross-hatched kind of purple section there represents the uncut <coughs> what we call the uncut chip thickness. And we'll get into a little bit later what all that means of, of kind of a theoretical chip thickness there. So that's what I'm going to take out. But if you look at the shape of that chip, you can see how thick it is at the top. And then it tapers down to essentially zero where those circles overlap. And that's the first thing that we want you to think about when we think about chip thinning for, for round tools. Um, you know, basically is the fact that we've got this chip and depending on where you are depth of cut wise, if I am a shallower axial depth of cut, I'm going to have a thinner chip if I'm running at the same feed rate as if I had a deeper radial depth of cut. Um, and this kind of shows it here. So the, the, the picture down here at the bottom We've got the same circles spaced exactly the same distance apart, but you can see how much thinner that chip is. And of course, it's 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 changing its orientation angle a little mm -hmm. bit too. Um, but that's that's definitely coming into play. So, you know, and again, when we talk about radial, I'll just finish the radial thought here for a second. If we are at 50% or more, so the top view there is drawn at 50%. If we're at 50% half the diameter or more, okay, we know that the chip thickness is actually going to match what our feed per tooth is. Right. But it's when we drop below 50%. So especially as we talk more about peel milling, dynamic milling, all that type of stuff, um, that's where that really starts to come into play. And um, So that, that'll hopefully introduce it a little bit. So here we've got Going into that width of cut, so same thing we were just talking about. You can see how much it influences it. So here in the upper left, we've got 100%. We're making a slot. So we've got our, our you know, we're going to hit that maximum uh, chip thickness. Right below it, we're, we're at 50%. We're still going to hit that maximum chip thickness. When we move over to the right at 10 and 20%, you can see how much that chip thickness really starts to change right so and we're going to try to make sure today that we cover a lot of the factors so the first factor to keep in mind is depth mm -hmm. is radial depth um the second factor to get into and you can see in this slide is is helix angle so helix angle will have an effect and the same when we get into some de indexable tools and um and we talk about that but the length of the cutting edge is also going to have an effect. Absolutely. So it's going to remove the same, let's say, thickness in this way of chip per revolution. But when we lengthen that cutting edge with a higher helix, you can kind of think of it that it's spreading that material out over a longer surface, and therefore it gets thinner. So that's another thing that, that comes into play. Um, now, one of the things that, that we will do, you can go to the next slide, Danny, is you can see that kind of influence there of the helix angle um, and how it changes as we go uh, go across there. And, and we will help with that. So when we 
design a tool and we test it <coughs> and we give those initial parameters that you can get from our catalogs, our CAS team, from Novo, um, we're basing those parameters for that particular tool with that helix angle. Right. So, so this is not something they really need to be. Yes. It's okay. something they need right. to be aware of, but nothing they really w need to worry about doing any special calculations like they go from a, a thinner or a slower helix to a higher helix. As long as they're using our base uh, parameters, we've already took that in consideration for that. Right? Absolutely. And that's, you know, so that's, that's something to, to keep in mind. Now, if you're a tool designer and you're wanting to kind of see what's going to happen with your tools and how you might change when you go through that, then this is something to keep in mind. So we, we just kind of want you to know uh, that it's there. And this is, this is one of the points of this is to think about, you know, so often we talk to people and there's usually one or two scenarios going on. Scenario one is somebody's looking for that sweet spot to run in. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where this data will help you dial in with knowledge of it. The fact, second factor is somebody found the sweet spot for this particular application, everything's fine. And then they change something. You know, they change depth of cut, they change cutter diameter, um, you know, these other factors. And man, it, it just worked great yesterday when I ran, you know, this part. Now I have this problem. You know, what happened? These are the all the little variables we want you to kind of put in the back of your mind of these are the things that are going to change this scenario that I need to look at. So, so that kind of talked about the radial part. Danny, why don't you give us an overview of axial part of chip thinning? So the axial, like Steve said, is is um, the area of the tool that is parallel with the center line of the cutter. And you see uh, chip thinning with axial a lot of times with like high feed cutters or ball nose cutters. And you can see here, even on this slide here that we have in front of us, um, you know, this would be basically a, a shoulder mill, indexable mill, 90 degree corner. You know, there's basically uh, the feet, the feet or the FZ is going to equal uh, the um, the um, uh, chip thickness, you know, the uncut chip thickness or the HX yep. that we have. So, you know, you have that and uh, it, it's, it's going to be the same. But as you start adding angle, it kind of works just like that helix you talked about. Mm -hmm. You're lengthening, lengthening that edge, uh, the length of it, and spreading it over a longer distance on the tool. Uh, even though you're feeding the same amount, then that chip gets thinner. And you see in this illustration here is uh, on, to the right, we have our, our feed, our program feed or FZ. But as we start increasing that angle, so like a 45 degree um, uh, face mill, mm -hmm. you would see that the chip is actually getting thinner. If you were to measure across here where these arrows are at, uh, or if you had a high feed mill, which typically you'll see on a high feed mill around 10 to 15 degree uh, lead angle, if you will. Uh, is, and that's the reason why we're able to feed it much faster because of that. Uh, you'll see here that uh, at 12 degrees, it gets even thinner. So we can compensate that by increasing the feed to get the chip back up to what it was at the 90 degree shoulder mill right. and increase our, our productivity. So uh, there's uh, definitely um, some advantages, both the radial like you talked about and also in the axial. Um, i get my slide's not changed for some reason, Steve. Right. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, it changed that one. And now, now it's working. All right, All right so uh, another thing to think about on axial um, uh, chip thinning is like ball nose mm -hmm. or coloring, or it doesn't necessarily And this is one of the there. ones that people miss all the oh, time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about that some more in, a, in an example that we have, but you see here that we have uh, chip thinning, and this will be basically representing a ball nose cutter. And uh, you can see here the, the, the dotted line to, to the left uh, is basically representing our feed or FZ. And then you can see that the, the chip uh, at the full depth to the top of the radius where we're tangent with OD would equal um, the, um, the feed. But as we get further down, then on the AP around the radius, then the chip gets thinner and thinner. So we need to take that into account as well. So that's, the, that's the, basically the... the uh, differences that we have with chip thinning, we have both radial uh, and we have uh, with the axial and we have with the helix as well. Right. Yeah. And, and definitely that's something that, like you said, we're going to talk more about later and we're going to talk about how you start to combine those two together because right. that's going to become really, yeah. really critical. So also think in terms of if you're running a corner radius tool, you're going to have possibly the same solution. 
uh, same situation. Yeah, yeah. Oftentimes you're running deeper than the corner radius, but still it all depends on how you're using it. Uh, and it is something that you want to keep in mind. Um, very good. So that kind of gives us a little bit of definitions, hopefully, of what's going on with the, with the very basics of chip thinning. So let's take it a little bit farther because, you know, we're not the only ones that have talked about this topic. You know, uh, we definitely encourage you to check out different things. We've written white papers on it that, that are available. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, a, a lot of other people have as well. So that leads us into, Danny, I think we should talk in terms of, of definitions a little mm -hmm. bit. So one of the things that comes up sometimes is that if, in terms of when we get into, let's say, engineering notation, right. we often see this HM designating a, a chip thickness. We often see an HX designating a chip right. thickness. Why don't we introduce that a little bit and, and talk about what that means and what the difference yeah, is? Yeah, I think it's important to know the difference between those two. I know that uh, I, I see a lot of times when people are giving me uh, explanations about what they're doing in an application and they'll use HM or HX interchangeably. But there is a difference and, and it's good to know the difference between the two. Uh, HX is basically that uncut chip. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, um, and, and, and it's at the thickest portion of that uncut chip. So that's the theoret what I would call the theoretical chip thickness. Right. Um, and then the HM is going to be the average chip thickness. So, you know, you, you basically have, um, you know, four different um, chip th uh, terms that we want to use in chip thinning. One is the program chip. That's how much we're feeding forward right. in the program per two. And that's we usually have, what we call FZ. Right. That's FZ. FZ. Right. And then we have uh, HX, which is the uh, maximum chip thickness. Uh, where the cutting edge will be entering into the chip. So that would be the maximum. Uh, and then the HM would be the average. So if you look in this illustration here, uh, which Steve's got it pointed out, that would be the average in the middle of that chip. And then uh, the last would be, um, what was that? I had the, the program, the max, okay, and then uh, the, act, the actual chip thickness. Yes. That's what it'd be. The actual chip thickness is the last one that we want to talk about. And basically that is what the chip itself measures. And that would be like if you, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later in, in an example that we have, but if you measure the chip itself, if you were able to uh, put a set of calibers on the chip or something and measure the thickness, it would be the actual chip thickness. And that really doesn't come into play that much. It does for us mm -hmm. when we're doing designing, but uh, it's not something that an operator or machine would really need to know. But that's basically the four different types of chips. Absolutely. And, you know, for us, yes, we're, yeah. we're thinking about that real chip thickness because we need to think about what to do with those chips, right. how to eject them, all that type of stuff. But absolutely, in terms of running the tool, um, you know, this, and you can work with either. You can work with HM or you can work with HX. HX is maybe a little more popular in the US. HM is a little bit more popular in Europe. Um, so the, you know, the one thing that I would say is you normally want to pick one and stick with it, right? You know, whichever formula you'd like to apply. Where you need to be, maybe a little care. I would say our preference, you know, is is, is we both like HX yeah. when we're helping people specify tools because we're looking at the the maximum possible impact on that edge. Um, but both are fine. Again, on the whole, they will trend together as you find your parameters. The one thing that you can start to see some things change. When you get very uh, shallow AE, very shallow radial depth of cut. So when we say AE, just for definition, we mean radial depth of cut, mm -hmm. AP, axial depth of cut. So when you're that shallow radial, um, what will happen is, is just due to geometry, HX and HM will start to become a very, very similar amount. So what, what happens is, is HX stays pretty constant in that calculation. HM starts to actually change a little bit in terms of how it makes you run the tool as you get really shallow, right? Um, so just something to keep in mind. So why would you? Why would we think that chip thinning, this topic that we're talking about, why is it so important to the machine? I mean, what, maybe you can give some illustrations on what. I, absolutely, and, and somebody actually just asked, you know, how does chip thickness influence tool life in case of an end mill? So, and it really doesn't, so this first part, it doesn't matter which type of tool it is, but definitely is, is applying to, to end mills. One of the things that we, we have to think about is that every material that we want to cut has essentially a minimum depth of cut. 
that's going to be determined on a couple things. So, you know, we've talked in some webinars before about elasticity. Mm -hmm. We've talked about yield strength, you know, those type of things. Um, basically, if we as, we, as we go back to one we did before, you can find on plastic and elastic deformation. We have to get past the elastic deformation. So again, we push on it, it pops back. Then we have to get past the plastic deformation. We push on it and it stays deformed to the point that we actually start to shear. So we have to take a certain chip load in order that, for that to happen. And that is uh, then coupled with the tool geometry. And I think we've got some examples of that. So not just the, the what we call the macro tool geometry, the helix, the number of flutes, but the micro, what's actually that edge? How sharp is that edge? Um, yeah, perfect picture right here. So a sharp edge, we could take a, a slightly shallower depth of cut, a honed edge, depending on the hone size. So as we start to get into these different edge geometries, they're really important for tool life because maybe they protect for chipping. Um, maybe they actually provide some benefit in, in lowering courses. Maybe another another topic for another day of how you can move shear plane and things like that. Right. Um, but as all that happens, that edge geometry needs to also influence what that minimum depth of cut is. So we have to remember that machining is <clears throat> You know it's not the most efficient process in terms of energy right so a huge amount of energy is essentially lost to heat mm -hmm. and one of the ways that we can make it more efficient is to reduce the amount of rubbing so if our chip thickness that we're trying to take is too thin we're going to have a lot of that if we go back and picture that chip the shape of that chip we're going to have a section of that chip that is below the minimum depth of cut, and it's going to have a lot of rubbing. So what we want to do is we're going to bring that chip thickness up to match the edge of the tool, be a certain, you know, certain width over what our actual edge is, and make sure that we keep that in a very efficient way so that we minimize the the amount of heat, the amount of friction that's being being generated. Yeah, so we can shear that material instead of push the material exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, so that's that's um and if so if we're too too thin, you know, we talked about what does too thin do? Thin too thin causes rubbing. What does that do? That causes heat, excess heat generation. Um, which definitely comes into play in terms of poor tool life. Mm -hmm. Some of the other things that can happen is you can, you know, we, we did talk before in some of our stainless series about, um, you know, with that, um, as we got into more of the material properties about work hardening. Right. So if we're doing a lot of rubbing, then we are definitely work hardening that material and we're going to make it more difficult to machine. We might also change the properties. So especially when we get into high temp alloy airspace stuff and we start to worry about white layer and generation and things like that this definitely comes into play um and then just the final thing is decreased material removal rate i mean at the end of the day you're not utilizing it yeah. exactly you know you've got you've got some free money on the table um where you can increase things without a danger to the tool right yeah. so and maybe even you, know, you say without a danger to the tool but even the fact that we probably Increase the tool life. Right. You know, we were increasing the metal removal rate, but also increasing it. So, you know, you, you talk a little bit about the negative side of not having a correct chip thickness, but to have the right chip thickness, you know, it's basically everything's the opposite. Of that. We're going to increase tool life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're going to uh, decrease the heat. Yes. Uh, we don't have as much rubbing going on because we're actually shearing the material in front of that cutting edge. Um, and we're going to have uh, reduced work hardening issues. Because you know now that now the cutting edge is getting behind that uh, work hardening mm -hmm. maybe from the previous uh, cut, so that's another uh, good thing about it. And then we're going to be maximizing the metal removal rate. Just like you said, we're 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 making money. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the the quicker that we can we can flip that ratio in in terms of you know what is good for the tool is, and of course, not just increasing your material removal rate. But again, if you're putting the tool in a better spot in terms of temperature, forces, all those type of things, and overall stability, you know, oftentimes, let's say a very shallow depth of cut, if it's not efficient, 
um, is is quite hard on the tool right. from from other things that then come into play. Yeah, I, so. I, uh, I know I told talked to you earlier about it, but I had a, a customer that actually called me yesterday, and they were uh, in an application where they were trying to do some some finishing work. Um, so they wanted a really nice finish, and they, you know, everybody thinks, well, well let's, let's back it down on the feed, mm -hmm. back it down on the speed, and all that. So they slowed it way down, and they were having issues. They were having build up edge. Uh, they were having uh, chatter issues. There was a lot of different things going on. Well, when I analyzed the, the parameters that they gave me, they were actually running so slow. Um, now, the program feed would seem bright, mm -hmm. but their actual tip, chip thickness, whenever they looked at how light of a cut, because they were taking a really light cut, um, and they were they had really not slowed it down as far as speed, but they hadn't accounted for the chip thinning. Right. And when we did the math and looked at it, they were running a chip thickness that was only about two tenths. So, you know, definitely not above that edge radius, and and that was the reason why they had the issue. So we ended up, you know, recommending to them to increase their their feed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, still keep it where they're going to get a nice finish, but not get it so thin that we're we're just pushing material around and smearing it instead of actually cutting it. And and you know, so the problem was was resolved. But that's just a good example of of where somebody thought they were doing the right thing, right? Like because they were needing a, a nice finish on the part, but really they just took it to the extreme too far, and you got to take that into account. Yeah, you know, that's that's a good point. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when you know I, I'd say that you know we kind of always start out with in terms of talking about chip thinning. You've got your tool definition. What shape mm -hmm. is it? What's the geometry factors that come into play? Then you've got your basic parameters, your depth of cut, right, feed speed that we've been talking about. The next thing that comes into play, usually people ask for a recommendation, you know, and you're always visualizing a straight line. Yep. You know, most, and of course, you know, when we get feeds and speeds without clarification, we're talking about a straight line. But the other thing that comes into play is the path, right? Right. So let's talk about that a little bit. What happens as you start to go into corners? What happens when you go into arcs? See, we had a question about tricordial milling, mm -hmm. and this will help us start to answer that as well. So why don't you talk a little bit about um, about corners and, uh, yeah, what we should do there. Yeah, obviously our parts aren't all straight lines, mm -hmm. so we have to take in consideration, um, you know, that, uh, that we have internal pockets with, uh, with internal corners. We also have external radiuses that we need to, to account for. But when you look at corners, uh, or, or I'll say – Instead of maybe corners, maybe we talk about maybe uh, any time we're not running in a straight line. When we start curving either on the outside of a part or on the inside, so either a concave or a convex type of, of tool path. When that happens, our arc of engagement, uh, and you see here in this illustrated slide here, we have, uh, if we're running in a straight line, we may have a 50-degree arc of engagement. Um, and, and we can calculate what our chip needs mm -hmm. to be, uh, what our feed needs to be to, to create the correct chip thickness. But if we run at that same parameter and then in, uh, introduce the tool to a corner or a concave uh, uh, tool path, uh, then and we don't change anything in the program, then we're going to have some issues. Right. Because now, where we've adjusted for that chip thickness in a straight line, that chip you know, immediately got much larger when it introduced itself to the corner. Forces went way up. There's a lot of other things that happened to it. Right. But today, we're just talking about chip thickness. So that chip is going to actually increase dramatically when we go into a corner. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, it also kind of take that that arc around and almost almost yeah. turn it into a slot. Yeah, right? we really. definitely have gone over fifty percent. Yeah, and it, and it all depending on how much material is left on the wall and all that. And and also a big thing is you know what the relationship is between the radius and the tool diameter mm -hmm. itself. You know, if the if the radius of the tool and the radius of the corner that you're doing are, are very close or the same. Then it can be, you know, um, much more higher arc of engagement uh, as that ratio starts changing, where the tool is maybe uh, much smaller than that radius, then then there's not as much dramatic change in the chip things. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why we always recommend, you know, when we're programming that we'd like to have a tool uh, that's at least 30% smaller than whatever that internal radius right. is, uh, just so we can drive that corner, not slam it the tool into it. And, and beat it to death, but we can actually come in and, and uh, the arc of engagement gradually goes up and then it'll, it'll fall back down. And we can still uh, do things like dynamic tool pass where we'll 
we'll uh, you know loop out the corners mm -hmm. and things like that, that we can do uh, in our programming. But just things to think about when you're calculating your chip thicknesses. Whenever you get into any internal corners or any uh, internal concave surface, but also the same is true whenever you go to an outside surface. Um, I know you know this is uh, uh, a thing that I see that's missed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really not going to be hard on the tool side per se, but you're leaving money on the table. Right. Uh, let's say you're machining on the outside of a large curve. You need to take in consideration that your chip is actually going to get thinner. This is another chip thinning type um, uh, thing that you need to consider when calculating the correct feed is that when you're running on the outside of a corner, your arc of engagement or your AE, your true AE, which is our radial depth cut, decreases. And this uh, is shown here in this illustration. You can see here to the right, this will be uh, representing running on the outside of, a, of an arc. Uh, you can see here that our, our AE is lower than, when, than the part uh, material depth. You see over here, this is how much material we're removing. And the true AE though is much less because of that, uh, because it's running on the outside. Uh, the opposite would be true if you're running on the inside of an arc. Uh, the AE, uh, you know, the material thickness may be uh, this small, which you see the allowance over here to the left, but it would be much higher in the actual AE uh, dimension, so the chip would be a little bit larger. So you have to kind of mm -hmm. uh, keep that in, a, in, a, uh, in, in your mind as well whenever you're trying to uh, determine um, what you need to do with your feet. And that's, I guess, one of the things for the question before about trochoidal. We won't necessarily get into all those calculations today, but this is essentially what's happening, right? Where, you know, to, to use, and let's say, make a trochoidal slot or trochoidal path, which typically is going to, mm -hmm. going to be a slot, right? Is we're kind of exploiting um, arc of engagement. Yes. By taking a tool that is smaller than the width of the arc, that we want to make, we can limit that angle of engagement, and we can basically take um, take chip thinning into account. Um, so again, you know, if you're going a full slot, that uncut chip thickness is whatever your feet per tooth is. Mm -hmm. You know, but when you break that relationship um, and introduce a smaller tool in an arc, that's where you start to be able to control other parameters. May or may not be the best in terms of cycle time. Uh, but when you want to lower tool pressure and control heat and things like that, that's when trochoidal really starts to come into play. Yeah, one, one major thing, to, to uh, since we're talking about trochoidal milling, and this has been brought up by one of our um, uh, people that's watching the webinar, is that you know, we need to make sure we know that uh, step over is not your AE. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, uh, we had a customer um, that in the Midwest that uh, was running one of our tools, and he was... Uh, he, he really loved this tool. He had some great success with it. And then he, he went to a new part and it had three different pockets in this part. There was one pocket that was, you know, uh, fairly large, one a little bit smaller, and then one that was really tight. And he was using the same tool for all three of the pockets. And he was using a dynamic tricordal type mm -hmm. tool path to machine out these pockets, all three of them. And uh, he, he, uh, he had contacted our local sales rep and said that he was having an issue that in this one pocket that occasionally he would have uh, a tool breakage and wanted to know you know what was going on and, and wanted to know if we could help out so i happened to be in the area we went and visited the customer and we looked at uh looked at the part and so i asked him i said so what's your uh your step over and he told me what his step over was well i'm stepping over uh i think it was like seventy thousand something i said so so um what are you doing in each one pocket? Are you changing that step or no? It's all the same. I said, well, there's your problem. So we went and looked at it, uh, and we did the calculations while we were there. And he was, you know, his arc of engagement was much higher in that smaller pocket. And so I said, well, you need to reduce your step or. He said, well, that's going to cause my cycle time to to increase. And he said, I really want to keep it where it is. Well, what we looked at is that the pocket that he was the larger pocket, he was not utilizing it efficiently mm -hmm. enough and we we're able to increase our step over there so we increased the step over on the larger pocket kept the middle one basically the same and reduced it by the end of the day we ended up reducing his cycle time a slightly a little bit right. but his tool life was just phenomenal it would it ran great so just things to take uh, take into consideration whenever you're doing um you know arcs and and knowing what your actual arc of engagement is and and how to calculate your uh, your true chip thickness absolutely
So I think another thing that we want to talk about while we're talking about, um, you know, utilizing the best um, uh, program feed to keep the chip is, you know, what do we do about finishing? You know, mm -hmm. when we're doing finishing, you know, obviously let's say our math calculation says that we can increase our feed, program feed, you know, uh, three or four times what it would be on the chip thickness um, because we're, we're, our arc of engagement may be low or our radial depth cut. But do we, we do we want to do that when we're doing finishing? Uh, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. So, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. We, we've got to be really careful when we go to finishing. So often people think, yeah, let's cut everything way down. We take it nice and smooth. That's going to give us the best possible finish. But we need to take into account that, again, we're talking about a, a dynamic process. Even mm -hmm. if we're not dynamic milling, it's still a dynamic process and that we've got cutting edges moving in space, right? So, you know, one of the things to factor in is that let's, let's say that you desire to have a little bit thinner chip in finishing, right? That's okay. You know, but when you drop that depth of cut to go along with it, that's where people so often end up, they have a chip thickness in mind, but they end up with something a lot less than that. And that's where you've got radial runout showing here. You know, that that's a big issue, right? So you've always got a certain amount from the tool. You've got a certain amount from the holder. You've right. got a certain amount from the spindle. Um, depending on what type of holder you have, the elements of that holder can all, you know, this all stacks together, right? So if you end up with, let's say, a chip thickness that is, let's say, under the inherent runout that you have there, then you're not fully engaged all the time. And that's going to oftentimes cause you to have a worse finish or, or at least not as good a finish as you desire. So we want to make sure that we are taking a um, depth of cut and a chip thickness um, that's that's enough to handle all of the other elements of that situation, um, and still is going to result in in a good finish. Same with with again, considering we talked earlier about the influence of the edge of the tool, whether it was a T land or a hone or uh, all the different types of edge preps that we could put on. So again, if you're working in a chip thickness under the edge geometry, it's quite unpredictable. Right, you know, so we need to get it above that to make sure that, um, you know, that it's going to give you a good result. So even if you're finishing, if you want to reduce, let's say, especially positional errors by dropping the depth of cut, great, no, no problem. But when you do that, definitely you want to take into account your chip chip thinning calculations and bring that feed back up to try to get that chip back in the So basically, we're saying we got a range, you know. So yes. so when we're talking about chip thinning. You know, we have what we would recommend in, at, say, a 50% engagement. But as that engagement lowers, you know, we can we can increase our program feed mm -hmm. to compensate so we can maintain that, that theoretical chip thickness or that HX that we've been talking about. But if we're finishing, we can lower it down some more to get that better finish. We just got to be careful not to go too low. Mm -hmm. We have, like, the situation I was telling you about earlier where the, the customer had only a two-tenths uh, uh, theoretical chip thickness, and, and that, that's definitely no, not okay. Mm -hmm. Then we're just rubbing the material. So yeah, I think this this it's good to know that even though you can go higher, when you do need to do that finishing pass, you need to be on the lower end of that. You just need to be careful not to go uh, too low where you're below uh, the um, the edge prep. And you know, for tools, um, you know, quarter inch and up, you know, it, it needs to be you know, I, I, you know. You, like we said earlier, when you and I were talking, you know, most of our up sharp tools, they have, you know, anywhere from a two to um, six micron edge radius. You know, tools that we say are sharp, you know, they, they have to have at least a little bit of an edge radius on sure. them. Um, that's just because of the grain size of the of the substrate coating and, and the coatings and things of that nature. So we want to be above that edge radius. So you need to take that in consideration. So when you do the math. And want to figure out what your chip thickness is. You want to be you know, a little bit above that, so you still create that right. uh, that shearing action with the material instead of rubbing it. So why don't we um, jump ahead and talk about a, a, a few different topics? And it looks like we've got time to kind of keep going here. So one of the things let's let's talk a little bit about. 
heat control thing, okay, um, and how that comes into play. And uh, we had a question come in, we'll keep in mind here, about how do we know that we got to the sweet spot of chip thickness? So we'll try to an answer that as we keep going here. We'll yes. give you some suggestions of how to do that. But let's talk about the heat here a little bit and kind of how that is um, influenced. And, you know, this also has a lot to do with not necessarily um, – chip thinning is as much as, let's say, dynamic milling, but we can kind of talk about it together here. Yeah, so, you know, when we start reducing uh, radio engagement or, or uh, mostly radio engagement, what we're talking about today, when we reduce that, you know, you're, you're not um, in, in contact with the material nearly as much. Mm -hmm. uh, so you think about when you're doing a full slot, you have 180 degrees of, of contact with the material with a cutting edge. So that cutting edge has 180 degrees of that rotation that's generating heat. Mm -hmm. uh, then 180 degrees that it can that it can cool down. Um, so it generates a lot of heat. And we will set up surface footage, our, our surface uh, footage on our, our SFM on our tools uh, according to that full slot. And so maybe it's, I'll give you an example. Let's say we're running titanium. If I'm doing a full slot, you know my SFM will be somewhere between 120 to 150 SFM. Um, but if I start reducing my radio engagement and getting down to say 10% mm -hmm. um, or, or even 5%, then now that, now that SFM can start going up because um, I'm not generating near as much heat. Not only am I not gen generating as much heat, Steve, I'm, I'm able to have a larger cool down zone around this right. as well. So there's a couple of advantages there. I'm not generating as much heat mm -hmm. and then what heat I am generating, I'm I'm giving the tool more time for that cutting edge to uh, to uh, cool down. So you see here in this illustration, this will be our, our arc of contact here in the red. So that'll be where we would be generating the heat. Mm -hmm. And then all the rest of this will be our uh, out of cut area where we're, having, uh, we're able to allow the tool to cool down. So for that scenario I was talking about, you know, where I may be running 120 SFM at, uh, at a uh, full slot, I may be running at say 400 or even 500 SFM for that 5% or 2% uh, radio engagement, like say maybe for a semi-finishing or a dynamic milling approach right. or, or even a finishing tool path. You know, so you can run much faster and, uh, and utilize the tool mm -hmm. properly. Yeah, I think that's one thing that surprises people sometimes if we give them a finishing, um, you know, a, a, a finishing cutting velocity that's higher than what they use for roughing. Yeah. You know, but Again, when you drop that depth of cut, you know, contact time is such a big parameter in the heat transfer calculation. Mm -hmm. So we've really reduced that contact time down, down, down as we drop that depth of cut. And you so, have to be careful when you go the other way, too. I know we've given uh, customers speeds and feeds for uh, a low radio engagement, and then they think that they can use that same speed yes, and feed for right. heavier engagement, and they, they, they find out real quick that that's right. not so. so you have to take into account what your radio engagement is and make sure that uh, your, your speed is according. And, and keep in mind, this is a little bit off topic, but we want we want you to be able to do both. So there's times that you're going to take and bury something in a slot, right? We design tools for that. We'll continue to design tools for that because in terms of time, it's efficient. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of tool life and other things, it's not as so efficient. And, and of course, it might require a lot bigger machine. So you know, when you when you flip over and you start to get into the dynamic techniques, that's where we're talking about today, really will shine and help you get a lot of that, that uh, time back, tool life back. So we talked there about heat, Danny, a little bit. Um, let's talk briefly about what happens when axial and radial chip thinning comes together at the same time. Yeah. And then we'll try to wrap it up with kind of how do we know about the sweet spot? How do we calculate it? Things like that. Right. So, you know, we talk about radial chip thinning. We talk about axial chip thinning. But, you know, I think about situations like coloring on mm -hmm. a part where you're doing some contour milling of a, of a surface. Um, you have to make sure, and, and this is missed a lot. I see this in, out in the field that people, when they're, when they're doing the programming, they don't think about it. But uh, when you're taking a, a ball nose or maybe a corner radius cutter where you've got it tilted off its axis, uh, when you're cutting those surfaces, those those uh, uh, contoured surfaces with those tools, uh, they don't take into consideration that we have both radial and axial chip thinning at play with this. So it's a, a little bit uh, 
uh, more difficult to calculate, and we, we've got some, some calculators for that we can help people with. But, um, you know, you need to make sure that you take into consideration, like you see here on the right, uh, this would be a, like a bonus tool with a, that's taking a cut that's shallower than mm -hmm. the radius. Uh, and and you got, that would be your axial chip thinning. But if you look over to the left, this would be like that same cutter laying on the side, looking at it on the axis. Uh, we have radial chip thinning because obviously when we're contour milling, we're not going to step over uh, 50%, right? Because mm -hmm. we want to keep that cusp pipe low because we're trying to get a nice smooth surface on this part. And we'll calculate what our cusp pipe needs to be. And we'll step it over, you know, maybe ten thousands, maybe you know, fifteen thousands, depending on what kind of cusp pipe we have and what type of radius we have on the tool. Mm -hmm. We we'll determine that as well. But when we step over that that minimal amount, it's not fifty percent of the tool, right? So if that's the case, then we're getting radial chip thinning too. So uh, we talked about rubbing the part while ago and, and having uh, core tool life because of it. This is where I see it probably more than any place right. is that people don't understand that they've got chip thinning going in both directions. And some of the, the feeds that we end up recommending from some of these, people you know, are really shocked to mm -hmm. see that you know, a tool that we would normally feed maybe only 2,000s, so we may be telling them to feed it 15,000s. Right. And they're like, you, are you kidding me? This is only a half inch tool. And then they, they're not taking consideration that, yes, 15,000s program feed, but my actual chip thickness, because we have it, uh, a thinning in both the radial and axial direction, May only be a thousands, right? Or or a thousand pounds. So. And and this is really critical for people to understand that really want to get into five axis machining and stuff, especially. Um, and, and it also goes to talk a lot about, let's say, the design of a really good five axis machine mm -hmm. that's made for dynamic machining because how fast you need those axes to move. Right. You know, when you go in and, and you're taking advantage of, you know, taking your ball nose tool or, or taking care of your high uh, high feed tool. And exactly when you've got chip thinning working both ways, like Danny said, the the feed rate that you often need to get to, and and of course in that case it might also be based on your rotary. You know, if you're doing a, a let's say let's just imagine a turbine blade or other similar thing, um, you get to certain parts, and it's amazing how fast you have to rotate and and you know simultaneously move. So, um, one yeah. thing, another thing too that they miss. When they're doing this, you know, there's they don't they don't take advantage of both those uh, properties of, of chip thinning. But another thing I see all the time is they don't calculate off the the effect of tool diameter. Um, you know, like say we have a we're machining material, uh, and we know what the SFM needs to be for that material, and they and let's say they're using a half inch diameter ball nose emule, mm -hmm. but their depth of cut is so light that their effective cutting diameter may be much much smaller than that. Right. Instead, and so instead of cut, calculating their RPMs. Uh, off of that larger diameter, or off that actual diameter, it calculated off the larger diameter, mm -hmm. and they're they're not utilizing the tool properly there either. So there's some you know major gains you can see here in this illustration we have pulled up. You know we're we need to make sure that we know what that effect of uh, cutting diameter is, right. so we can calculate that speed correctly. And that's it's that's exactly it. That's where the speed needs to come. Now I know we got we've got an example before we go into the um, to the factors for uh, adjusting the speed and the and the feed. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about the example where you and I had done a test here. Uh, it's been a few years ago, but, but it's still relevant today mm -hmm. uh, that we can show where we, we took in consideration speed. We talked, we, we looked at uh, the radius itself to, uh, to increase the step over and, and uh, sure. reduce the scout volume. Cool so let's uh, look, maybe you can talk a little bit about what we've done. This has been, I know it's been some time back, but I think it'd be yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. So this this was you know just some experiments that we started to do, and we, we like I said we actually wrote some some published papers off of some of these. So we kind of went through and we looked at the effect of of chip thinning both in terms of, of from simulations, so FEA simulations as well as collecting chips, measuring chips, looking at forces, things like that. But this this example here would be, let's say that we were wanting to do some, some surfacing type passes mm -hmm. on this part. So it was looking at how we could take advantage of the shape of the tool. So we kind of started out with, you know, what happens with the diameter versus the percentage of radial engagement. Danny talked about the axial, so the effect of the ball. So we looked at what happens when you take a ball versus, let's say, a bull nose or one of our high feed mills, a, a very, very flat radius. 
And um, yeah, we made up some tools. They were half inch tools. We did a bunch of machining in 6AL4B. Um, again, we, we used uh, Advantage from, from Third Wave to kind of study uh, some of those chips, um, as well as, as making actual chips. So it's kind of neat. Here we have actually the same tool four different ways. Yeah. CAD model of that tool that's driving an FBA model. It's also driving, driving a grinding simulation that then drives one of our grinding machines in our lab to, to make tools to test. So we've got a ball nose geometry. Um, in the next slide, I think we've got a what we would call a, a more of a foreman mill, contour mill, high feed mill, um, where basically we're able to take advantage of a much flatter radius which gives us a lot different effect in terms of chip thinning when you go in and do the math. And yeah, you can kind of see that right here in this slide. So here we have exactly the same step over. We have exactly the same program feed per tooth. You see the effect though of how the chip thins and changes. So color in this case is corresponding to temperature. Mm -hmm. You can see how much hotter and more concentrated the temperature is on the ball nose chip uh, and on the ball nose tool itself, where you see kind of that blue area back behind here, um, versus the, the contour high feed tool, where we've, we've spread that out. So um, that's kind of looking at the effects of temperature. But we also then looked at, okay, let's take advantage of this, and let's speed the tool up. So, right. um, yeah, you can kind of see that on this, this slide here. We started out with... Um, taken exactly the same cut, then we said, okay, well, what happens if you take this high feed tool and you increase the feed per tooth in order to maintain the same chip, chip thickness, thickness, right? right. Um, and, and you can see the difference. So you can take a much higher feed per tooth that gives you a higher material removal rate. The other thing we then looked at though is especially when you get into surfacing, coloring, contour milling, whatever you want to call it, you know, the cusp pipe. So basically the shape that you leave from the tool as you move over your step over, the height of that um, cusps or the, the height of the surface there. If we said, okay, that's now going to give us a flatter surface, we can take advantage of that and go to a, to a bigger step over. So you see when we take a bigger step over and we adjust the feed to keep the chip thickness the same, you know, we had a 67% increase in material removal rate to make the same finish, right. have the same chip thickness, similar tool life. Tool's not um, working any harder. Tool's not working any harder. Similar temperature. And that's really a, a, one of the points that we just kind of wanted to drive home today. Again, this is more to kind of introduce the topic, but to get you thinking about how these different parameters affect this and then what that does for you. At the end of the day, we're not... Here, the, the point of this webinar is not to say, we're going to tell you how to make your chips thinner. Mm -hmm. The point of your, this webinar is to say, you need to understand that in some situations, you're changing the chipness of your, uh, the, the thickness of your chip. What can we do to get it back? And sometimes that's going to save you a lot of money. So I know we're, we're about running out of time here, Steve, so I don't want to uh, miss this last slide that we have, basically showing some of the multipliers we have for chip thickness. So you see over here to the left, um, this would be like a, a, a screenshot of one of our catalogs right. showing a tool that we would normally you have. You don't have to memorize this. Right. Yeah, this is this is right. a typical chart from one so of our catalogs. Can, yeah, so you will see here with uh, this tool where we have 50% engagement, you can see the, the speeds that we would recommend and, and then the, 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 uh, the chip thickness. So you could take that, and as you know that you're going to be reducing that radial engagement, uh, the, these would be like your multipliers for mm -hmm. speed. In multipliers for feed. So you see here that on our uh, speed, I'm sorry, on our uh, feed per tooth, uh, you see it over to the right hand column would be what we would multiply the, the program that you are the, the recommendation over here to the left. So if our uh, at 50% engagement, you see it as a one to one, right? But if we drop this down to uh, 4% uh, engagement, then we, our multiplier would be 2.6. So we're going to multiply that feed by 2.6, and that would be what we would want to program into our machine. Uh, that would maximize our, our, our feed. Also keep in mind though what we said earlier, that if this is a finishing application, you might not necessarily want to go to that full 2.6. You may want to back it down uh, just slightly to where you still 
have a nice finish, but you're not uh, below the edge radius either. Right. Um, and then over to uh, bottom left here, you see the multiplier for, for your VC or your speed. So if you know if we have a tool that's um, as, is recommending uh, you know 200 SFM, let's say, uh, and you drop it down to uh, a two percent AE, then that 200 SFM is going to jump up to eight. 800 SMM. So there can be some huge gains here uh, in, in uh, your overall production of the tool without jeopardizing the tool performance as far as tool life. So these are just some examples of it uh, that we have for multipliers um, and, and this will help you to understand you know, the best way to get the most yes. out of your tool. Yeah, and, and this is a simple, we wanted to, to kind of show a simple way. Certainly there's there's more complicated formulas to come up with these multipliers or that you can use um, but you know oftentimes you find yourself splitting a tenth or splitting a few microns right. and you know the idea is is you know to make an effort to get started in the right direction um, so you know in terms of finding the sweet spot this is a good way to start so again find your recommendations and especially find your recommendations for that tool that material and, and normally, if you're not sure what to do, you can, like Danny said, find that 50% engagement. That's what we're saying. The normal maximum chips for that tool should be the, the range. And then you can start to apply these uh, multipliers and, and make some tests. Right. So if you had a situation where you absolutely don't know what to do, Let's say you have a, a very unique material or you have a very unique setup um, and you'd like to find it out, out on your own. Still maybe consult some, some of these catalogs, Novo data, maybe have an idea where to start. You know, but you know, what we would do, of course, in our lab, we've got dynamometers, we've got high speed cameras, all sorts of things to, to study it and refine detail. But you know, if we were in the field and, and we wanted to do this, we'd start with pretty much a simple chip chart. We we may not cut that part, you know, if you've got a test piece that you can work on, take, um, you know, a pick, a depth of cut to run, you know, something maybe 20, depending on the design of the tool, of course, maybe something between 10 and 30% percent, you know, AE, radial depth percentage, um, set a range of feed per tooth and make you a little chip chart. Collect some chips, see what the chips look like, see what your finish looks like, listen to it, and and that's one way you can start to determine, um, you know, for yourself, you know, what's a really good chip what's thickness. The base, yeah. And then you can take these same exact multipliers calculations and work it up or down depending on exactly where you're running. So, yeah. um, you know, certainly you can you can get more and more complicated from there for how fine you want to get, but that's kind of the basis of a good start you know if you were completely on your own and wanted to, to, to find yeah. a place to start a new material um that would be our first approach before we start to get more scientific with it yeah i feel really bad today steve we, we we went through all this presentation and we haven't been able to address a lot of the questions that's been answered or have been asked of us but uh you know we'll keep all these questions in mind we can probably try to get a hold of you guys uh after the, the webinar is over but uh plus you know, we're going to continue this thought process in some future mm -hmm. webinars. So we'll we'll kind of look at the questions that we have, make sure that we try to address those in uh, the webinars that come up in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So next one, we're going to get into, like Danny said, some more topics to this, and especially around coloring and some things like that. High feed tools will be in the next one, and we'll go from that to pocketing. So please look forward to the next ones there. Again, uh, give us a uh, give us a like, give us some comments so we know how we're doing, some things we can work on. And, um, yeah, hopefully we hope to see you soon and hope to see you in the next webinar. Thank you very much. See you guys. All right. Bye.